Good afternoon, everybody. I have a dream. We all must have heard of this powerful speech many, many times. And this speech, of course, has inspired me for many years. As a moderator of this panel discussion, I would like to discuss a dream which was envisaged five years back by Junaid when he was a county director, what we call India-Africa Lighthouse Solar Initiative. Let me share a few facts about dream before we go into the panel discussion. An average person dreams about four to six times a day. In a lifetime, we take about 150,000 dreams. When we get up in the morning, in the first five minutes, we forget 50% of our dreams. In the next 10 minutes, 90% of our dreams are forgotten. But very rarely, dreams come true in reality, but it does come in reality. Today is one day for me, for the World Bank colleagues, for MIGA colleagues, and for ISA colleagues, that dream has come as a reality. Five years back, when we dreamt that India Solar Africa facility would a dream come a reality, we have come a long way. As August mentioned in his opening remarks, almost one year back, we signed the MOU with MIGA, and then we have closed a deal in Congo in Nuru. And today, as Junaid mentioned, we have expanded that to a platform by making a trust fund, what we call solar facility. So today, yes, I feel very proud that dream has come true. With this, I would start with a panel discussion uh, with my dear friend, my mentor, my role model, Ms. Anita George. I always struggle to introduce Anita, and I'll tell you why. Well, he has, she has led uh, IFC in India, then became a global director of the World Bank, then became the top employee at the largest pension fund in the world, CDPQ. And if that was not enough, now she has started a startup, like a 35-year-old, and still going very strong. And now she has been a brain and architect of what we call a global solar facility at ISA in partnership with World Bank. So Anita, in the background of discussions, what August mentioned, the challenge in Africa, what Junaid mentioned about the potential financing framework, how does global solar facility fit in all this? Thank you so much, Amit. I couldn't ask for a more generous introduction, and I'm very happy to be here with all of you and to celebrate really what you said is a momentous day for us to kind of formalize the hard work that a lot of teams, and I should commend the ISA team, many of you are here, and also the World Bank Group team who worked to make the Global Solar Facility a possibility and hopefully very soon a reality. Um, when I look back in 2008-2009, when India first started on its path of commercializing solar and IFC was involved in financing that first megawatt of commercial solar, you know, uh, as you rightly said, Amit, it was a dream because solar was an existing technology but not at all prevalent in emerging markets. It was an expensive technology. And the third thing was that the regulatory framework was still evolving. So at that time, from then to the journey that we've all traversed together till now, uh, shows that actually we can do a lot. Uh, and solar today, I can proudly say, has been mainstreamed. It's become competitive with other sources. And the dream continues that, especially for those who do not have access to energy today, uh, the 700 million that August referred to, that solar should be able to reach each and every one of them. And that's where the role of distributed renewable energy becomes very important. And uh, we've been in this journey where utility scale uh, solar 
was seen as unique and a new technology. Now we can look back and say it's been mainstream. Then we went through a phase where commercial and um, industrial supply by private sector to private sector, so B2B businesses has become more and more prevalent. I'm very proud to say that every single solar uh, platform in India has a global pension fund or sovereign wealth fund or insurance company backing it. This is what we now want in the B2B business of solar. And the ultimate, which is also Prime Minister Modi's uh, latest initiative on proliferating rooftop solar, where the World Bank Group has played a very critical role. And this, I think, is where we can really bring in that risk capital, concessional capital, to make sure that we attract enough private sector capital to then bring these sectors to becoming mainstreamed. So my dream is that every household will be able to afford solar going forward, not just in India, but across the global south, in particular in Africa, in a manner which is affordable. Because I think that's what I've seen through my experience. When a product and a service becomes affordable, it becomes Main Street. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anita. Uh, now, Aniban, you have been a guru in this uh, uh, area for, for many, many years, if not decades. Uh, if I can take the liberty of asking you a little bit more complex financial question, uh, you know, uh, building upon what Anita said. We have all heard the rosy numbers, you know. Uh, Anita was, is still very bullish on solar and financing, but the hard reality is, as uh, Again, August mentioned in his opening remarks, 600 million people, uh, no access to electricity. 50% uh, sub-Sahara, no, no access to electricity. We have been hearing this now many, many years with little change in numbers. And if, if I give you an example of, even of India, we are a large uh, uh, country with a very good policy and uh, you know, stable government. Even in India, for net zero target, $150 billion are required. And currently, we are getting $50 billion. There's a gap of $100 billion in energy efficiency, clean transportation, and renewable energy. And one of the reasons is because the public sector financing is able to mobilize private sector financing only in the ratio of one is to one. If Government of India and World Bank puts a dollar in the market, we mobilize only a dollar from private sector. And this is, a, this is not a very good number. Because the funding, public sector funding is scarce, a one dollar should be able to mobilize three dollars in, especially in a country like India and then also in Africa. And we have been hearing about the hundred billion dollar gap on climate finance as well. In this background, uh, uh, with a mixed bag of success and failure, Anirban, what suggestion do you have for us or people sitting over here or, or for World Bank and ISA, building upon the GSF example which Anita gave? So, uh, thank you for, for having me and uh, let me try to address the question which is still now not solved, which is the question of financing. And in a very short answer to this is, you are right, and I think Jilead also spoke about it, is blended financing. Effective, well-structured, blended finance which pool brings in different pools of capital because every tranche of capital has a very specific role to play. And like you said, I think right now in India, if you look at the green financing that has come in, at an absolute number, it's not small, even though it is far less than what we need. It is still into tens of billions of dollars, but it is largely uh, debt, and it is largely, uh, even when we talk about the different pools of capital, largely concessional debt. And that does not, in most of these cases, it does not, is not enough because the kind of risks you are dealing with are technology risks, these are market risks, these are optic risks. Uh, so therefore, the blended finance is the answer. But getting to the right answer in a very case-specific, hyper-local situation is something that requires a collective village to come together. And therefore, something like an ISA is the orchestrator of that, where you bring in 
maybe governments, international organizations, you bring in at some point the different pools of capital to come together. Eventually, private sector has to kick in and then the communities. But the entire stack has to talk to it. Coming to the point about solar, I think we have, uh, we have extolled the virtues a lot, but still uh, humor me for a, for a minute to extol a few more virtues is that uh, as Manita said, this is, at, this is an at scale technology. This is now the capacity installed across the globe is significant. It is in terms of uh, the level S cost of electricity is amongst the lowest well, in at scale solar. In the decentralized, there is work to be done, and therefore this uh, MOU that got signed is so so heartening to see. And the solution lies in, in, in exactly that, that beyond the point, we have to start getting very specific to the context. Uh, developed country solar is uh, renewable is more about the transition from legacy assets. Developing country is about minimizing our uh, round-the-clock solar cost, which we are going towards, which requires storage and hybrid and so on. For a, a, a low-income country, that is about the managing the high cost of capital. Uh, for an island nation, it is about the vulnerability and the and la lack of land availability. So each of these requires a very bespoke solution, which have to address the specific risks that come in and then bring in different tools of capital in terms of first laws, in terms of you know, uh, the credit guarantees, and then uh, bringing the, the private sector. So yes, uh, uh, a slightly simplified answer to your question is that blended capital, blended financing is the key to unlocking capital, especially in areas which have higher, uh, higher, higher risk uh, in, in whichever shape and form. But to get that, you have to get very specific, you have to get very quantified, because each investor will like the return, whether it is in terms of uh, return on capital or it is in terms of the impact on the ground. But it has to be quantified, it has to be specific, and that's the way to go. That's why these alliances and this combination of different pools of players coming together is possibly an uh, extremely essential step in the right direction. Thank you, Anirban. Thank you very much. Uh, 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 next, uh, of course, is uh, Ramesh sir. I had the privilege of working first with him in Seki and now with ISA, and a tremendous experience. Uh, Ramesh uh, you know, um, Anirbar, uh, representing a strategy consultant, uh, they are expensive, but they always have the right answer. You know? So, so blended finance uh, uh, is actually the right answer, and I am a big fan of blended finance. And in the interest of audience, if I take uh, the liberty from my colleague also Jay from Mika to share a very quick example on blended finance and how it has worked. Uh, for example, we in 2016. Uh, government of India asked the World Bank to sign a loan, billion dollar loan on solar rooftop with uh, SBI. Uh, India is a leader in uh, renewables and solar, but in 2016 we were struggling on solar rooftop. And when we signed the SBI solar rooftop, first it de the market, because that time uh, uh, there were capacity building regulatory issues. After the de and when the assets were working for four or five years, we recycled the World Bank loan by bringing in commercial capital uh, from, uh, from Citibank uh, 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 and other for $200 million facility. So even within World Bank Group, uh, and even we blended our financing with capital market by using the mega guarantee, even within the World Bank Group. And now we have an uh, additional $200 million to invest in other technologies. You know? So I, I believe by releasing the market and by using asset monetization, we are able to use the same market again and again for for uh, a pension funds like CDPQ, who are very risk averse, if I can use the word, to then come and invest in markets like this. So Ramesh, building up on this example and, and what GSF is now going to do, can you please share your experience, as, especially for African countries? Uh, first of all, thank you. Thank you, Amit, to be there in the wonderful panel of discussion. Uh, very interesting uh, topic. Uh, I, I had the privilege, I would say, to be part of the long story of solar growth in India uh, from 2013 till almost 20. Uh, uh, the, the learnings are very, very important uh, from those, uh, whether it is for a large scale projects like solar parks and also like Superbus scheme built out for uh, the rooftop scheme, which was uh, supported by uh, World Bank. Uh, just stepping back, uh, I'm also a really good admirer of uh, World Bank because World Bank uh, 
I was working uh, or uh, associated with World Bank. I was since I would say 1988. Uh, many of the NTPC when I was in a long uh, uh, working experience in NTPC, and at some point of time, World Bank has been. I mean, I would I would say NTPC has been the biggest beneficiary of uh, World Bank. What apart from the funding, the real uh, value addition the World Bank has brought to NTPC or the people is the a systemic approach uh, uh, that has uh, really transformed the working and the culture and the and the approach of every professional approach. So that's the capacity building of the company. Uh, so that's the one of the key maybe uh, I would say World Bank also funds rather than they have so much of a capacity building program. Now, uh, over the time, uh, the, the entire narrative has changed. Uh, the the uh, uh, private sector participation has become more re uh, relevant than the uh, relying upon the public sectors. And so the World Bank also, I'm sure, with the creation of IFC and the approach has really helped in a transforming their approach and which you also talked about beyond that where such a blended finance kind of approach you have taken for Superbando. So I think uh, just looking at uh, uh, say rooftop uh, segment, I think the, uh, you know, when the, uh, we had an ambitious target uh, in, uh, set in 2010, uh, 2014 in India, so we had a target uh, of 2022 of uh, 20,000 megawatt at 2014. But the new government uh, had immediately changed into from 20,000 to 100,000. So 100 uh, gigawatt was the capacity target. And people were wondering how we are going to do. Uh, and, and naturally, it requires a multi-pronged approach. Uh, and then there is a, a rooftop segment uh, and also the large scale projects. So that's way, uh, that is actually many, many times when you put a target, you also find solutions. So one of the solutions, if you see for the rooftop segment, we thought we will uh, add from Seki, the first uh, one or two projects, we started in some of the cities like Bangalore, Hyderabad, uh, and then Pune. Uh, to start with, you know, uh, there is no regulations, nobody knows what is to be the regulated, and the, uh, I would say, the these forms have to be on board. Uh, what we thought, let's put some projects first and see then that, that should prompt for uh, uh, getting the regulations. So that has really triggered the starting and the, then the rest is in history, the, uh, the, the rooftop program and the World Bank pitched in and the kind of uh, financing you have been doing. One of the biggest learnings I would say is uh, taking the segment, even though uh, the rooftop segment in India has not actually progressed as we thought in 2013-14. There is multiple reasons. Uh, I would say one of the reasons uh, is uh, the, the capacity building of the people. You know, uh, why, uh, I was just thinking, why do we require a capacity uh, building of the common people? At early, earlier times, the power is only a I would say power flows only from the generator. So the capacity building has been traditionally done for the people who are involved in the generation, transmission, and distribution of the people. But like this rooftop and all the, I would say the net metering, which is a very simple, actually it's a, it's a, the people are generating now. So people need to be trained or uh, given the right kind of advices so that they understand that and then they, because you are, they are part of the generation as well, you are not only a consumer, the what you call consumers. So this is a two-way process and so there is a lot of capacity building required and really World Bank has helped in that capacity building. As one example, the other example would be after the power of aggregation which you have also done in for the commercial scale in some of like uh, in uh, Madhya Pradesh and all. These are the stories, actually, we could have a lot of lessons coming from there. And then these things can be taken to Africa. Now coming to the global solar facility, we are in the process of creation, but the real uh, test will happen once you start doing it. So that phase will come when we are really implementing this global solar facility. I think uh, Anita will uh, give more uh, update on that because 
we need to test that through some projects and because that will give a feedback if any a fine fine tuning is required so that is to be tested now so i would uh, stop here at this point of time thank you thank you thank you ramesh i have my marching orders to close the session but before i go very good point on institution building on power grade uh, ntpc and now seki uh, ramesh was very generous uh, in his appreciation for world bank i want to assure i did not write his talking points he said everything on his own uh, but just before closing uh, 30 30 seconds each uh, Uh, I want to put Anita on the spot, and then uh, others will have some time to answer. And thank 30 seconds. What's your dream for us, for audience, in in five years, ten years from now, in terms of financing, technology? And so on? Uh, my dream is that the 700 million people who don't have electricity have it. Makes a huge difference. If you can all just take a moment to think, if you had zero electricity, what would life be like? and we still have 700 million who face that reality my other dream is that the global solar facility in partnership with the world bank group can really make a big dent in the m300 that dr ajay banga and the world bank group is talking about and i think isa is very capable technically they have great people like mr ramesh uh, to deliver that thank you and even your dream please so i think uh, uh, we are at, at a growth stage i would like this to reach scale so 5 10 years from now uh, it will not be called round the clock anymore it will be just be called power and it won't be called blended finance anymore it's just be called finance amazing very quickly i think uh, uh, the addressing the 650 or 700 million people i think that is one area where we need to find a clear sustainable solution we just did an analysis i think around of this 600 or 650 maybe 200 to uh, 250 million maybe has very remote areas even mini grids may not be possible and you need to have the kind of a full uh, grant supported kind of uh, uh, solutions as a home systems or whatever it is if you want to address that because of the demographic Uh, around 200 to 250 thousand uh, million people can be done through the mini grid rather than extending the grid the rest can be probably uh, uh, reached through the grid extension so this is what we should do i think this facility once we create uh, i think we need to address and make it a very sustainable uh, 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 approach to uh, address this issue uh i don't wait up to mathur is but uh, if he is listening i think these are big huge dreams uh much more powerful much more demanding than the last one we took so i i request everybody to work towards uh, the 700 million blended finance in looking at this solution as well with this i would like to close the session thank you very much thank you i request our panelists to stay with us uh, on stage let's give a huge round of applause to all of them please We dream only when we dream do we conquer. And let me invite Mr. Moise Sharif, India Energy Lead, World Bank, for the closing remarks before we bring the entire discussion on stage to a formal close. Can we please put our hands together for Mr. Moise? privilege to uh, wrap up this uh, session so first i wish to really thank our distinguished participants uh, in this uh, session on catalyzing uh, solar leadership uh, through knowledge exchange uh, it had been really very very interesting very rich exchanges on the role that solar power can play in accelerating access to electricity for close to 700 million people as we heard who still lack such access particularly on the african continent uh, we also discussed india's achievements in electrifying the country and how sharing this experience with other developing countries particularly in africa could be mutually uh, beneficial uh, we heard in particular from dr matur um, his uh, ambition uh, for the isa in partnering with the world bank and mega uh, to mobilize private sector financing uh, 
uh, de-risk it, uh, improve the regulation so as to attract private sector uh, investment on a large scale, on what he called population level uh, financing. And he gave the example of the Nuru uh, project in the Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, which is an impressive uh, achievement. Um, so we also heard uh, from uh, Auguste, the World Bank country director, how the World Bank Group and the African Development Bank have designed the Mission 300 uh, project in order to uh, bring the benefits of electricity to 300 million people uh, on the African continent who uh, currently do not have access to it, and this target is by 2030. Um, uh, as we heard, rooftop solar systems and solar mini grids uh, with batteries are becoming more affordable and therefore they are offering uh, solutions for bringing electricity to remote towns and villages uh, that were um, maybe perhaps not, uh, not possible uh, previously. So even for grid-connected consumers, distributed solar power offers very good opportunities to lower their bills while helping to meet um, the uh, climate um, mitigation objectives. Uh, and uh, particularly India's experience in expanding rooftop solar for industrial and commercial uh, firms and for households with World Bank uh, support could be replicated uh, in Africa. We also heard from uh, Junaid uh, that mobilizing private participation is crucial for boosting solar energy globally and uh, how the World Bank Group guarantees are ideal instruments uh, to fuel this endeavor. <clears throat> As they offer very high leverage uh, when compared to direct uh, lending, i.e. Uh, the, the, the purpose here is to mobilize private sector financing on a, on a very large scale as public sector funds you know, are not sufficient to achieve the, the objectives that, we, that, that, that needs to be, to be achieved. So um, this is why the uh, ISA and MIGA have forged a partnership to boost solar energy globally and announced the establishment of the MIGA ISA solar facility to de-risk solar projects in the most difficult market conditions. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the MOU that was signed today between the ISA and the World Bank aims to facilitate such private sector participation in solar energy projects, particularly for uh, mini grids and distributed renewable energy resources, uh, such as standalone solar systems. It will also uh, create an enabling environment for scaling up electrification in low-income countries, in rural areas, and in areas that are affected by fragility, conflict, and violence. So, we just uh, uh, heard uh, from our uh, panel, you know, about their dream, essentially, of universal access to uh, energy powered by re re renewable uh, sources. This is a very powerful uh, dream. The panel discussion gave us concrete examples uh, first of India's experience, uh, for example, with solar parks and through distributed rooftop solar solutions. Um, secondly, how to push the envelope in more difficult areas such as energy efficiency, e-mobility, uh, and the role of uh, blended finance in this, also in uh, bringing renewable energy solutions in uh, higher risk uh, countries. Um, so they, they also discussed how the, the, this rich experience and lessons could be uh, replicated in, in other developing countries. Personally, uh, having worked previously in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa on the uh, energy access agenda, and now uh, uh, leading our uh, energy work uh, for the World Bank in India, I can really see the tremendous benefits that this uh, collaboration between the two regions could, uh, could bring. Uh, bringing the benefits of electricity to all people in a sustainable manner and 
uh, in an affordable way, very important, is the worthwhile journey that we have embarked on uh, together. So the international partnerships and the knowledge exchanges that we are having today uh, are very valuable tools uh, for this journey. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you again for your dedication to this course. Thank you very much, Sushil. Please stay with us for just a little bit more. And Mr. Ramesh Kumar, can I kindly request you to present a memento to everyone on the dais? Everyone, can you kindly come forward? Sir, can I request you to please join us in the middle? And for our audience, can we please put our hands together for the distinguished panel right here with us on stage? This was Lighthouse India catalyzing solar leadership through knowledge exchange. Okay, so everyone is presenting to everyone. Let me just get this clear. So, yes, sir, thank you. Mr. Kumar, yes, we request you to do the honors. And we can pose with the gentleman for a picture, I know. <laughs> And of course, for our moderator, can we have a round of applause, please? Thank you. Let's get uh, everyone in one frame before we wind the proceedings of this session uh, up. Thank you. One final round of applause for all of them, please. Thank you once again. The next session, ladies and gentlemen, which is the session nine for the day, is about youth in action, catalyst for next-gen solutions. To set the context for this session, I will be requesting Kapoor Fatima, consultant communications ISA, 